but there's a better act to come. It's an honor for me today to do what he usually does, and that is to introduce our speaker, uh, John Schufeld. <laughs> Even though he is my chiropractor. But I tried to come up with a one-liner, and the best I could do was he's the only friend that I know that's really got my back. <laughs> Well, I 
did something very different that evening. I'd never done it in my life before. I went back to church. And I walked in the door of that church, and an elder who I'd met in the morning was standing at the bottom of the stairs. <clears throat> I walked through the door and he says, John, do you have Jesus in your heart? Now I really get both barrels. And I said, Ed, I don't know. And he gave me the most beautiful response. You know what he said? Let's go find out. Now Ed had been doing this for years. How did I know? Because Ed took me into the furnace room of that church that was built in 1856. And as we walked in this dark dungeon of a place, I noticed there was two chairs and a table and a Bible. Ah, evidently, this wasn't the first time. But Ed shared with me what it was to become a believer, what it was to give my heart to Jesus Christ, what it was to be saved. And I gave my life there to the Lord, not knowing what was going to happen. But you know what I expected? What do we always expect? Come on, where's the fireworks? <laughs> Nothing happened at all. <clears throat> but I look back now at my life and I see that I don't know how I even possibly survived except for that moment. That's what started. Well, as I was challenged with this message years into my practice, I had to think, have I had any tough lessons that God has shown me? Well, I got out a piece of paper and it took about a minute and a half to write about seven down. And I picked three that I thought would minister to my heart as I shared them with others. First one happened, oh, I'd been in practice about two years. I'd been saved about maybe six months. We went to a Christian conference resort and the speaker, a fellow by the name of Bob Ramey, from Moody, Moody Bible Institute. By the way, our son David, David Matthew Robert, is named after this guy because of what I'm going to share with him. So he preached one Sunday, and he said, if you think you own anything at all, you're wrong. He said, God owns everything, but he lets us enjoy it. And he went on and talked about other things. I don't remember all the message. All I remember is that I was very frustrated because, because my young practice wasn't growing. You know, we're not in this to sit there and starve to death. We're in it to do something and see some results. I was all fired up now that I'm a chiropractor and I can help all these people. And everybody was there except the people. And it got kind of frustrating. So I happened to go for a walk with Mr. Ramey and we we're walking along the beach. And he said, so, how's things going? And I said, I wish I could say great. He said, what's wrong? I said, well, I've been in practice coming up two years and it's just not building the way it should. And here's what he said to me. Who owns your practice? I said, well, I do. Oh, he says, wrong answer. And I stopped. I said, well, what do you mean? I, I put it together. I pay for it. Oh, yes. Well, of course. That's what managers do. But we don't own it. He said, 1 Corinthians 10, 26 says, For the earth is the Lord, the, the earth is the Lord's, and all it contains. Everything. It's not yours. It's his. So he said, I think the problem is, you don't realize that you're not the owner. I said, well, what, what should I do? He says, well, step into my office. And there was a large tree right there. And he got down on his knees right there. And he says, join me. So I got down on my And he immediately went to prayer. He said, Lord, John has a few things to talk to you about. One of them is the fact that he's kind of mixed it up to this point. And I just pray that you'll help him ask you to straighten it out. Bingo. I said, Lord, forgive me for owning it. It's not mine, it's yours. All I want to do is manage it. So I confessed that and gave it back to him. And then I started to get up. I said, Amen. And started to get up and he held me down. He says, Oh, Lord, one more thing. Would you send 
Shaw sign this week that he is now the manager and not the owner? Amen. I got back to the office. This was a Sunday afternoon. I got back to the office Monday morning. I was averaging maybe one new patient a week to that point. Phone started to ring as soon as we arrived. 25 new patients. And we found that the new patients keep coming as long as he keeps on it. Every time. If I get off track, down it goes. It's incredible. But that's the way God works with his children. He's there to pour out these gifts and he will keep on pouring as long as we stop only. And that was the thing that he told me right there. He simply said, get rid of it, it's not yours anyway. So that's been a struggle for me all the way along. But now I'm learning that I have to manage what God allows me to have. And we'll build it, but only with his help. That was the first lesson. The second one, I call this one, Trust God, Love Men. I brought a young doctor into my practice back in those days. In fact, I helped him through chiropractic college. He had been a construction worker who got all excited about chiropractic. <clears throat> Said he was going off to chiropractic school. Couldn't afford to go, and I decided, well, I've been blessed. I'm going to turn around and help him. So I did. Got him through school. He came back into my practice and joined me. And everything was going really well between the two of us. Until I got home each night, and my wife said, so how did it go today? I said, I had a great day. Well, I don't know. She said, I don't know. I said, what don't you know? She said, I don't know what it is. But there's something not right about that relationship. Now, this guy was a believer, and a good one, as far as I was concerned. He knew the Lord, he was on the worship team at church, you know, I thought everything was going, but something just didn't ring true with my wife, something about it. Well, then he came to me and he said, would you ever sell this practice? I said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, I've been kind of thinking about it anyway, because Carly, my oldest, was heavily involved in skating, as I mentioned, and I was getting pretty tired of going down Barry twice a day minimum. And I thought, maybe we could go to Barry and start a new practice. So I thought, well, why not? So he said, how much? So I threw a number out. Just threw a number out. 48 hours later, he laid a signed offer, or an offer ready to sign, down on the desk. He had gone out and got full financing for everything I had asked. It was a ridiculous amount, but he had asked me, and I just threw a number out. He wanted it that bad, and he wanted it fast. Anyway, we closed the deal very quickly, and I bought the practice, or he bought the practice. I was to stay a year. Well, the practice started to slide the following week, and it kept on sliding. It wasn't mine anymore. I was doing my best to keep up my end of the bargain, but this fella had a problem. What I have started to realize, and this is what my wife had picked up on, but I had not seen, was the fact that he saw every patient as dollar bills. The more I see them, the more I make. And he really didn't care how they felt. It was just a question of how much can I make. Well, you know, if you've been to a chiropractor, if you've been to my office and you ever feel that, you get off the table and tell me, because generally, People come out of our office and they're, they're feeling the way they're supposed to feel. Because I've never ever looked at a patient that way. God has blessed us. And what is, what is money? It's the reward of the service rendered. Do the best. God's going to bless you. It's the way it works. Do, do your utmost with your talent, your skills, and God will look after the rest. And I've always tried to keep that going. But somehow this fella got off track. And that practice started to go. Well, it got so bad that I had to leave the practice. Instead of a year, I only stayed four months, but I came to Barry and started a new practice here. The practice was, we were seeing around 300 patients a week in that day up in Midland at that practice. And within six months, it was down to about 90 visits. It was nothing. It was just disappearing. And it was funny because we had another associate in the practice with us at that time who left when I did and he moved across the street and everybody went there. Well, it made sense because they felt that they were welcome there. That was the difference. My wife finally shared with me I never trusted him for a second. There was something not right and it was probably that that I was reading and fortunately she didn't say, I told you so. Boy, gentlemen, we got to wake up and listen sometimes. Because God will speak our other half and share some things to us that we better listen to. Anyway, that practice disappeared. He immediately blamed me for the destruction of the practice. 
and took action against me through our church. Our church didn't know how to handle it at all. Brought in outside mediators that were not believers. And you can imagine how that went down here. It got to the point where I found myself here in this practice in what I would call almost a funk. I didn't know what to do with myself or with what it was doing. I would cry out to God for it to be fixed and it just didn't seem to be getting fixed. Long story short of it is that he declared bankruptcy and all of the debt that was owing on the practice because I had been given bad advice, much of the debt came right back to me. So here I am going to pay twice for the practice that I already sold. Anyway, the difficulty I had was I was really bitter. In fact, I've told a few people that I was so bitter that I think if you'd come by and said, give me a hundred bucks and a can of gas, I would have taken somebody up on it. I mean, I was furious about it. My attitude went right down the drain. I couldn't believe that I was the way I was, and I couldn't get out of it. Well, then I saw what was wrong. I put all my trust in men and not in God. And it was my wife, my wife who woke me up to that and said, get your eyes back where they belong and stop this. God has so many wonderful things in store for you that he wants your attention back at you. And it took me a while, but I finally came to my senses. To the point where I got a, a song from the Lord, Psalm 37. Let me just catch it here. And it really spoke to my heart in, in a way that helped me to turn completely around and get away from where I was. I put all my trust in them, not any trust in God, and this was the result. Psalm 37 says this, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I stopped there. And that still small voice said, read one more. And it says this, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. <laughs> wow. All the power of heaven waiting to act. And I was being silly. Anyway, the Lord turned it all around and it's just been amazing. I was able to forgive this individual. I didn't think I ever could. Well, then comes number three. Number three builds out of number two because number three was one that lasted a long time and it was of my own doing, basically. All that had happened with that young doctor for so long left me in, as I described earlier, what I call funk. I just couldn't think straight. Oh, I had forgiven him, and life was better, and we were heading on, and the practice was growing again, and the phone was ringing, and, but I just seemed to have somehow lost the spark. And oh boy, did it drive me nuts. Do you know that went on? about, oh, just a little over a year ago. And then I was given a passage that woke me up. The passage came from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It says this, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raised us to dead. Boy, did I wake up. I realized I don't deserve to have an opportunity to fret. <laughs> because God is the God of the universe. And he's got plans for me. And as long as I'm focusing on me, I don't have time for what he's already got planned. And it's then that I woke up. He reminded me then, he said, it's mine, give it back. 
because I was holding on to something, just as Robert Ramey had told me to let it go. Then he said, trust me and keep your focus where it belongs. Well, I did that, and it's been dramatically different. I just cannot believe what God has done in lifting from my shoulders that which was of my own doing. And he's so good at that. You know, if you've never met Jesus Christ personally, if you've never taken time, as I did with that guy Ed, and look at what it means to be a believer, then you are being gypped of so much. Because God's got incredible plans for every single one of us. Well, you know, God's also got a sense of humor. Because <laughs> about a year and a half ago, he sent me another young doctor. But this time it was different. This lady had been a patient of mine since she was 10 years old. And she got all excited and decided she wanted to become a chiropractor. So when, from the time she was in first year of chiropractic school, she and I have been plotting for her to come back and join me in practice. And she's there now. And a year, October 1st, she buys the practice. But she's also begging me already. Don't you think of leaving? So we, we'll see. Maybe one day a week or something. We'll see how it goes. And you know what God has done? He sent me an unbeliever. Why? So I can share with her, yes, my skills and my talents. But I can also share with her, as I've done, my life story. And the fact that he is the one who has kept me on track. Now, she sat down with me the first day of work. After our contract was done, everything was ready. She sat down and she said, something I need to tell you. I said, okay, first day, let's get it all out of there. She said, I am non-religious. And I said, good, so am I. She said, oh, I beg your pardon. In your treatment room, you've got a doctor's prayer. I said, yes, I used to be religious. But you see, religion, one of the definitions of religion is looking for God. Back in 1978, I found him. She said, you found him. And every day since, there's been some discussion about who he is. And it's her that's raising him, not me. You see, God's already got her on a journey. And he's going to use me, maybe, we'll see. But the point is, he knows who he wants to bring across our path. All he has to do is get our attention. And if we keep our attention with him, he will do anything. We have no concept. You know, we sit here in this venue and we look across the barrier. Just think if the Lord was to come back right now, how many people would be left? Because the scriptures say, but sounds were gone if we know them. How many people would be left? I look at the fisherman out in the boat. Is he going to be there or is he gone? We don't know, do we? But the thing is, God wants us to reach out to as many as we can. That's the thing. And as long as I keep my eyes on him, I know he'll be using me. That's the wonderful thing. So I hope that'll challenge you a little bit. Uh, today, I wanted to share some of the dark side of my life in that regard. But the beautiful thing is God always makes it light. doesn't matter what it is. So God bless you and thanks for listening.
So I give this to John, and if you already have one, you can give it away. <laughs> so thanks again, John.